And those deals can be fantastic. You don't have to have the expertise. You can bring in systems that you've developed elsewhere to help grow the business. You've got a guy running it that really knows it well. So there's a lot of reasons why you would want to do that. The SBA won't let you. You can have the seller stay on for up to a year. There has been some changes to this, but that's still generally the rule. And really, an employee, though? stay on it, yeah, as an employee. Uh, or even a contractor. And within that year, it really has to be focused on transitioning the business. Did you clear your cash flow? All right. Well, we got Will Wilder on the pod today. So, uh, Will, you and I met at Main Street Summit in Missouri, uh, which I guess is like the halfway point for each of us. You're coming from Denver. I'm coming from Philly. So, you know, we met up in Columbia, Missouri at the Main Street Summit, basically a giant hold co conference for people who are buying and operating companies and doing M&A and all that kind of stuff. So I learned a ton at that conference. Super interesting uh, lineup of people and speakers. Uh, but, you know, just quick, quick thing on your background. So you uh, came from the consulting world. You were at McKinsey for quite a few years. And I think you got to a point where you're like, hey, I just want to do this for myself and have skin in the game. So you ended up going out, putting together financing. You bought a company uh, in the furniture leasing space and you're now you know, running the show yourself. So uh, did I miss any important details on the intro there? No, uh, I guess the one addition on the background was uh, before working at McKinsey, uh, I was an infantry officer in the Marine Corps, um, and that was where uh, a lot of my interest in, in you know working in small teams really stemmed from my time there, um, and carried that forward. That's cool. What's uh, before we go into the business stuff? I'm curious if there's anything from you know being in the infantry that carries over to business. Like, is there any kind of like discipline or just you know like kind of grind or you know something that that you've kind of skill you developed there that applies to what you're doing now yeah i think a lot of things um you know, the marine corps specifically is uh uh generally regarded as kind of the the least well-funded branch um so anyone that is successful in the marine corps for a long time has a, a developed an ability to uh get things done under adverse circumstances or when it's not exactly how the system is supposed to work or funding is supposed to get approved. You figure out ways to get the training you need, get the equipment you need, um, get your guys to school when you know there's not enough spots available. Um, so all of that stuff is directly into running a small business. Um, you know, a lot of my time in the Marine Corps was dealing with um, all the, a lot of personal issues that Marines would face. Um, you know, they were, most of them were 18 and right out of high school. Um, and this was the first job they've ever had. Um, yeah, they were buying cars for the first time. Um, potentially a lot of them were getting married. Um, uh, and, uh, a lot of the stuff that, you know, I was 25 at the time, um, things that I had done, I just got married two years ago. So that was, uh, and I'm supposed to be, you know, helping them out on that stuff. Um, and that's all things that, you know, now as a business owner, I've got 14 employees, they've all got personal things that they're dealing with, um, and being able to understand that they're all humans, they've all got challenges. Um, and how can I be compassionate and a good leader and set a company culture where, um, uh, you know, we have, we have work that needs to get done, but, um, the people that are going to do it are the employees. And if I don't respect them as people and don't acknowledge that they've got challenges and help them out when they need to be helped out, um, you know, the work's never going to get done. They're going to leave pretty quickly. Um, and it's not going to be a place that I'm going to be be proud to be a part of. Um, so that's sort of definitely carried forward. And I think the last part that actually was uh, a real help in consulting too was, you know, as a as an officer, especially a, an entry-level officer, you spend a lot of your time with these guys who are 18 to 22, um, you know, high school education for the most part. Um, and then you would put together operational plans and long-term strategy stuff that was moving you know, hundreds of Marines across different countries or continents and millions of dollars of equipment and live fire stuff. And you'd brief all of that to commanding generals or colonels um, so you needed to be able to, um, 
you know, be, be yourself and be authentic, but be able to be effective and two very different audiences potentially and, you know, back-to-back meetings or back-to-back interactions. Um, and in the business world for me and at McKinsey, you know, working with C-suite or division managers at major international companies and dealing with frontline machine operators, uh, very much mimicked that. Uh, and it's the same thing for my company now. If a lot of our customers are large national uh, companies that I'm dealing with, they're procurement managers and folks that have 20 plus years in industry experience and are pretty sophisticated. And, and then figuring out, you know, how are we dealing with our moving guys in specific states uh, or um, client uh, individual customers who are students in a lot of cases. Uh, so a lot of that has been uh, very much a carryover from my time in the Marines. Cool. That's awesome. It sounds like, yeah, there's a lot of crossover there. Uh, let's go into your business. So new new image leasing. Uh, I think you closed on that, what, late last year or something? Or you've been in it for about yeah, six months? in the uh, middle of September. So coming up on five months here. Yeah. So let's go into, you know, tell us about new image leasing. You know, what does the business do? And then we can maybe dovetail that into why you chose that business and what your acquisition criteria was when you went out to market. Yeah. Um, so new image leasing is, uh, we're a furniture rental company. Um, uh, we're based in Denver. We also have a, a second satellite location in, uh, in Kansas city. Um, we, our primary customers are uh, corporate and insurance housing. Um, so use case be if, you know, a large company in Denver is moving, um, engineers here for a specific project for six months or something they'll um they'll want to put them up not in a hotel for that period of time um and we'll hire a corporate housing company to help them find the property um you get internet and cable and all that stuff set up and get furniture rented and installed um so we would work with our partners or the corporate housing companies to to get those um units set up and comfortable for those executives when when they come here and very related to that is the insurance housing business. That's where, for example, um, you had a, a flood in your basement or water pipe burst when it was really cold or something. And there's a lot of work being done to your house where you can't live there. Um, your insurance company will often uh, have in your policy that they'll find a, a location for you to live comfortably and safely, uh, generally where your regular house is. Um, and we would work with those companies to to furnish that for you so that it felt as close to home as possible while uh while your house was was getting fixed up. Um uh, most of the time for that, that's you know, that burst pipe scenario. But um here in Colorado, we have a lot of uh forest fires. Um happens we have a big one every couple of years that does a lot of damage to houses. Um so those are kind of the major events for us where there can be a hundred families all at once that are displaced and we're trying to to work to get them all um, in a comfortable place while, while they're figuring out a, a pretty hard part of their life. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, uh, I, I know a few, I know a few people who have had to deal with that and it's, uh, it's just uh, devastating to life. So just, you know, having a, a good place to land without having to think too much about it. And, you know, a good insurance company, I guess, does all that logistics for, for those families and kind of gets the, gets the ball rolling for them so they can have a soft place to land. Yeah. So that's what we do. Um, we also do some real estate staging, um, which, you know, statistics really benefit people that actually invest in staging up front, even though it can be a bit of a sticker shock. It's relatively small in, in the overall price of selling a, a home. Um, so we do that and we do some individual stuff. So I, I, I said students as an example, uh, military members. We have a lot of bases here in Colorado as well as uh, in the Kansas City area. Um, where people will be sent temporarily and makes their life a lot easier to be able to, to come to places like us and furnish their house for the year or whatever that they're going to be there instead of moving. Um, you know, people that are moving to Denver and their stuff is in a shipping container somewhere. They need furniture for three months. Those, so a bunch of different use cases. Uh, but yeah, all of that was, um, you know, it's a, a tangible business that I could understand. So those are reasons that it was attractive to me. Uh, the company's been around now since uh, 2008 um, and with the, the guy that I bought it from was the founder uh, and he'd been in the furniture business for about for his whole professional career. So about 40 years now, 45 years uh, and has migrated to this over time. 
um and his son works for the business his son's uh, my my operations guy my number two guy um and he's been here uh for about 15 years now really since it was um you know freshman high school and and legally allowed to work um so really attracted to the fact that it's a business that i could understand that i could i uh from my time at mckinsey did a lot of operations work so there were things that i thought i could add to the business that would um, help improve it from where i thought it was already on pretty solid footing um, and that it was a very stable family business that I wanted to keep that way uh, as much as possible. So all of that uh, makes it so I'm, I'm uh, while I'm learning a lot every day here, I do feel pretty comfortable with the team around me and, and the work that we're trying to do. Yeah, it sounds like you've gotten your feet under you pretty well at this point. Yeah, a bit. Um, you know, we uh, I'm trying to get more of an understanding of the seasonality. Uh, you know, we we do a lot of intern packages and stuff like that that are more spring and summer. Um, so we're coming out of our slow season now, but picking up. Um, and now I'm really starting to focus more on what our long-term strategy is and and some of those uh, bigger ticket items that uh, will need to be my and Cody's focus over the next couple of years to grow our footprint potentially beyond those two markets we're in now um, and what we need to do to, to make that a smooth uh, smooth plan. Yeah. I was going to ask like levers for growth. I mean, is there, uh, is the lever just expanding footprint ge- geographically or is there like market expansion that you could do or how, how do you like, how do you scale a business like this? Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of different parts of it. It's, it's not, um, scalable like software is where, you know, once you build it, it's just selling another thing doesn't take any effort. Um, but, uh, you know, the the levers are fairly straightforward. You have a lot of our clients now are these national corporate housing companies. So um, what can we do to do more work in our existing markets with them? Um, part of that will also be how do we work towards the fringes of our service area? Um, you know, for us, uh, you know, Albuquerque is a five hour drive from here. So we can service down there, um, but it's harder uh, so how do we figure out what the pricing is? How do we do the delivery costs uh, in a way that makes sense for for customers down there? Uh, within those markets, you know, I think we've we've historically built really strong relationships with our existing customers. We really haven't done much in terms of marketing or outreach. Um, so I think there's huge potential for growth in the staging, uh, markets in Denver, where we do a fair amount of work in Kansas city right now, where we do no staging work. How's the um, housing market there, by the way, is it still hot? I know Denver was insane during the pandemic. It's been pretty flat for about the last year, uh, but there's like no inventory. So it's gone up a lot over the last couple of years. Um, and the pricing is held. Um, but with the interest rate issues no one's selling uh, so whatever goes on the market is selling pretty quickly but not not much is reaching the market yeah interesting all right so it sounds like mostly that like ex- that staging real estate areas and expansion uh can you outbound to like these bigger partners you mentioned like the corporate housing type partners can you just like outbound and build more of those or is it more just you've already got the relationships um i think there's it depends on the specific customer. There's some that we get, um, you know, an, an odd and then contract here and there. Um, usually it's things where they have a national partner who's also in Denver. Uh, and for whatever reason, that person or that that company couldn't deliver, whether it was too far or the timeline didn't make sense. Um, and they'll call us to see if we can uh, fill a gap for them. And we, we do our best to say yes to as many of those things as possible and usually can make it work. Um, so I think a few of those, if we can flip that equation of they'll come to us first and and go to that other company, if for whatever reason we can't deliver. And, um, so there's probably four or five that are in in that boat that would make a significant difference to us. Um, there's four or five that we get most of their business now, but would like to be able to get all of it. Um, so some improvement there, um, the staging is a big one for us um and then i think there's uh, a lot of opportunity for uh, working with realtors both staging as well as for 
when they're representing a family that's moving to Denver and their stuff's not here yet. You know, it, it's not through a company. Uh, it's just the individual use case of we need something for whatever reason. Uh, you know, we're, we just bought a house. And we don't want to spend an extra 50 grand on new furnishings or whatever. The realtors are going to be our best source of information for that, um, as well as some property managers at the larger uh, units here. So I think that's our in-market growth. Kansas City's got a lot of potential for that as well. This is, they've really only been doing uh, work for our main customers here. They'll also do in Kansas City, but we've done next to no outreach in, in that market. But the bigger uh, opportunities are ultimately going to be in heading on new markets for us. Um, probably will be where they can be mutually supporting. So within sort of six hour drive of our existing places would be where we would want to inch towards. Uh, but that's plenty of markets, whether that's Kansas City, Memphis, Louisville, uh, Des Moines. We could theoretically do St. Paul or Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, Salt Lake City, Boise are all kind of that tier. Um, and then, you know, Southwest, there's a lot of desert, but you could do Albuquerque, you could do Phoenix and and that would make sense too, even though there's not much in between. So, uh, I, I know there's like some big companies in this space, like Rena Center or some of these other, you know, I think I've heard of a few others. Are they like, uh, competitors or are they, uh, just, are they just a different business or something? Um, Rena Center's sort of a competitor, sort of not. They're a lot more of like rent to buy, uh, which tends to be um, lower quality inventory uh, and targeting a um, less financially stable customer. They're a lot more direct to individual and for people that can't afford to buy new stuff, that's kind of the pay over time at a higher rate. Uh, and it's a great service, but you end up with a lot of uh, issues with collections and spending a lot of your time either repossessing furniture or figuring out how to work with people to get them to pay. Um, we've mostly tried to avoid that by having most of our work be with businesses. Um, and where we're not, uh, we do pretty carefully vet folks. Um, our main national companies are uh, AFR, it's American Furniture Rental and Court, um, C-O-R-T. Um, Quartz, a Berkshire Hathaway owned company, um, and AFRs, I believe also private, uh, backed by private equity, but was a family business for a long time. Um, they both have, uh, a bunch of national contracts. They're in most markets. Now we had a third competitor, Brooke furniture, um, went out of business and was acquired by AFR. So AFR grew their footprint pretty significantly a couple of months ago. Um, and then there's a number of folks like us that are in one to five markets. Uh, there's a handful of other companies that are that are bigger, uh, but uh, Furniture Options is one. And Southern Furniture is another that are in the kind of 10 market range. Uh, still pretty regional, but bigger than we are. Uh, so our, our major competition when we look to go anywhere is, is usually if there's more than one other person like us, um, it's going to be tough for us to crack that unless for whatever reason we think they're providing bad service or too expensive or whatever. Uh, and if there's more than one of those national companies, it's we're going to have a lot of our customers that we would try to get already have contracts with those folks. Uh, so it'd be, be tough to peel them off at least right away. Uh, those companies do a little, some other things. So the furniture business is broad. Uh, I, know I listed a few of our things, but wedding rentals also sort of falls under furniture rentals. Um, event rentals. So, um, think like if there's a golf tournament, all of the bleachers and hospitality tents and all of that stuff, like that's rented by primarily AFR. Uh, there's also office furniture with cubicles and desk chairs and all of that stuff. Uh, court does a lot of that. Uh, so there, there, there's different nuances to it. Both of those, uh, you know, court with office, they'll use that as a way to package services for a given company, but we'll rent to your office. Uh, we'll, we'll furnish your office if you're you know, opening a new place in Denver relatively cheaply, but we do want, you know, all of the furniture rental for your housing needs for folks that are moving here as a part of that. Uh, so interesting dynamic here in Denver, we've got court as our primary competitor. Um, 
but each of those markets that we're looking at, it's a little bit different of a dynamic. They're also in Kansas City too. I can tell you've got a, a consulting background because you you definitely know the market and the TAM and you know you've got you know all that kind of stuff uh, figured out in your head like how to expand this and how to grow the business. Uh, I, I, I think it was a good segue to go into how you chose this company. I, I, I know you were looking at a whole you know plethora of different industries and markets and businesses and. You landed on this company. So what was, uh, you know, maybe we start with what your what your criteria was, uh, yeah. but then, you know, kind of work backwards into how you identified this company as matching your criteria. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you look across people looking at business acquisitions, there's a million different ways you can slice it. Um, I think the most important thing is upfront being really clear about what's going to work for you. And you know, some people will have a very specific business thesis. So they came from software development at you know wherever, and that they think they have a competitive advantage there. If they bought a, a software company that you know had a good product but could tweak it or didn't have marketing or whatever, that they were confident that they knew that industry, they knew their customers, they could grow that. Great, like that you have a pretty specific company focus, then you're probably going to have uh, a have to have a pretty broad geographic focus and you might have to be willing to move from san francisco to chicago or des moines or texas or whatever um so there's trade-offs and for me it was uh you know i after looking at a bunch of different options i wanted to be able to be 100 percent owner and take on very little investment if at all possible um I love Denver and we've now been here for six years and wanted to stay. So geographically wanted to be more or less within an hour of our current house. Um, so a lot of options, but still very geographically restricted in the, the grand scheme of things. Uh, and then I wanted a business that uh, had a tangible physical thing and an and a actual product that I could understand pretty quickly. Um, I think there was a lot of similar things around um for example uh uh contracting work where i understand generally the idea of here's how you build a house here's how you source materials here's how you build a project plan all of that um but i have no experience in actually bidding that and having the expertise of here's what the cost is here's how we actually make sure that we have enough margin up front to absorb the good bad and ugly that happened with that um, so a lot of that technical knowledge, uh, I was pretty intimidated by becoming the owner and having that knowledge walk out the door on me uh, and, and being on the hook for performing um, in a space that required that skill that I didn't have. Um, so all of that led me to pretty narrowly focus on on businesses that were relatively straightforward, that were relatively small based on what I could afford and were within driving distance of my house um that's what worked for me definitely it's not what's going to work for everybody uh and and certainly limited the things that i could look at quite a bit um but uh if you keep at it for me it was th- that combination was not a this company doesn't exist best of luck to you it's like it exists it might not happen right away it might take six months might take two years uh so kind of coming to terms with you're looking for not the rarest of things but something that's hard to find and you're just gonna have to be patient and look at a lot of things and wait it out uh i think it's a hard part of looking for the acquisition yeah you talked about something too in our pregame about uh likelihood that the seller would actually sell and uh talked about kind of like trusting the seller and you know is the business above board and then you know kind of like the reputation of the seller with their suppliers and customers and vendors but you know kind of the key point behind that was are they actually serious about selling are they just shopping for market you know market valuation understanding are they you know are they actually going to be on board with the valuation that's you know realistic in the market and you know so how how did you kind of assess that when you were you know talking to sellers um, yeah, I mean, great point. You're um, you're going to spend a lot of time, like the diligence process from issuing an LOI to actually closing for me was three months, and it was like a month and a half before the LOI from when I first heard about the business to actually having an offer that was 
signed it on everyone's plate. I mean, that's even so, kind of fast, I think, right? Yeah, that's relatively fast. So, I mean, that was four and a half months combined. But if you end up with a seller that's not going to sell, you don't believe them for whatever reason, there's a big potential that you spend five months, six months chipping away at getting a deal done with someone that's ultimately never going to happen. Um, it's a big cost to you in terms of time. It's a big cost to you potentially in terms of money with legal fees, accounting, travel if you need to. Uh, so figuring that out pretty early is key. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways around it, but the easiest way is when you first meet with the person. It's like, why are you selling? Uh, just ask them. Um, and there can be a number of reasons for that. The most obvious are uh, I want to retire. Uh, yeah, we have uh, some family thing that's going on. Spouse is sick, kids sick, um, you know, whatever that's making it so I don't have the time to put into this company or I need the money for some major thing. Um, it could be that this is their second business and they've got something else that is either more attractive to them or more interesting or in a location that they're moving to um, and they don't have the time to spend on both. Um, it could be that there's, you know, in, in my case, uh, I think the the seller and and his son, um, while they have a good relationship, they were at a point where they probably couldn't both stay at the company uh, just from what they each of their ambitions were for it. Um, so he, there's plenty of motivation for it. And it could be too, and this one's less likely that, um, you know, I've taken this business as far as I can. I think I'm time. It's time for me to, to pass the reins. Um, that one for me is harder to believe at least it's more possible if that person has a track record and you're like, okay, I've done, I founded four companies and I've sold all of them. Like, okay, great. Like, you know how to start a company, you know how to build it to whatever base load and then move on. But you know, if, it, if, it's, if that was the case for this business, uh, I would have had a lot harder time believing it. Like you've been here for 12 years, you've sold one business before, but that was sort of accidental um, you know, around your divorce. Um, you know, you don't have a track record of building and selling. I don't know that we're really going to get to that point. Uh, and ultimately, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, like valuations for these smaller businesses are not crazy multiples. So from a financial point of view, um, it's almost always going to be better for the seller if they can hang on to this for the long haul and, you know, invest less time, hire a manager or whatever, uh, unless you know, they want the cash now to do whatever with it. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's get into that. So, uh, like how, how, how do you generally look at these things from a valuation perspective? Like what's, what's the model for this type of an industry? And then, you know, you looked at some other businesses, like how, how did the, were the valuation models similar across the board or were there differences across different industries? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the easier business is to scale, the more expensive it will be. So your software businesses are going to be a higher multiple. Uh, but anything outside of that, that's a business like this, that's a construction business, that's a window cleaning, that's, you know, whatever, uh, is generally going to be somewhere between like two and four and a half X um, free cash flow or what they'll call seller's discretionary earnings. Um, the a challenge with that is when you get into really capex heavy industries so if you're doing a um, demolition business like you probably own some really expensive pieces of caterpillar equipment and whatever else is a part of the deal and like what you would like to do as a seller is be able to say like you're going to buy the business for you know, if it was three if it was a million dollars in free cash flow You'll buy the business for three million, you know, three x that cash flow, and then an extra million or whatever for the equipment. And like that's just not the way that it's going to work because I'm buying the cash flow, and for me to buy the cash flow, I need the equipment that generates it. So, I'm my price for the the million dollar cash flow is going to encompass all your equipment, um, the uh, 
any machinery that you've got, any inventory. In my case, that was a big deal of actually buying all the pieces of furniture um, or delivery trucks. All of that's going to be included in that multiple price because you're not going to get the cash flow unless you have the rest of it. Um, and then the range in that multiple will largely be on sort of size and really sophistication of the business. So if, you, if you're buying a company that's you know, 250,000 free cash flow, you're probably closer to that two range. If you're buying something that's three to five million free cash flow, you're, you know, four and a half or, or higher in, in some cases up at that, that end of the scale. So uh, I've seen a lot of businesses list with, uh, you know, like a multiple of cash flow plus some kind of like inventory cost or equipment costs. And uh, I'm always curious about how often those companies sell uh, with that, uh, with that factor. I mean, do you, do you have any insight into that? Like how often buyers will actually pay the multiple of cash flow plus the, you know, the inventory or equipment? Uh, very rarely. Um, in some cases they'll do some of it. Um, but you know, if I was a manufacturing company and I was, they wanted me to pay for they they'd accumulate a whole bunch of raw materials and wanted me to pay for all of it. Like I'm not going to do that. I don't have a great deal of confidence that it's not outdated. It's going to tie up a ton of my cash on the upfront side. Um, it's going to incentivize them to potentially buy a bunch of stuff that isn't going to be useful to me after close so between our contract and when we actually close. Um, so you can in your negotiation you can say like I'm willing to pay you know, whatever it is, like three months worth of uh, usable materials and that, and you can be specific on it's these SKUs, it's the stuff you're actually going to use this, like your display items, your inventory for discontinued products. Like, I'm not paying you a dollar for that. Like you can, if you want to liquidate it, great. If not, I, I'm not buying that from you because it's not worth anything to me. Um, so all that can be negotiated specifically. I very much would not recommend paying um, paying for that. Some of the equipment too, um, I would make sure that you find somebody that really knows what they're doing to value that and to do a uh, assessment on its viability. So if you're buying trucks, like get a mechanic to look at your truck because you very well could be stuck with something that no one has done any maintenance on in five years and you know, all of your deliveries are dependent on this truck that's about to need a hundred grand worth of rebuild, um, or you're going to have to buy a new truck right away. Um, yeah, the, for me, the inventory of like, great, you have all these couches, but like, are they all trashed? Have they all had, you know, a rat infestation They had a bug bed bug thing or whatever that, um, is going to make this where I'm buying a warehouse full of trash that I need to pay to get rid of and then buy new. Um, so all of that is stuff that you should basically take off the purchase price and be like, I'm going to have a one-time expense of a hundred grand to buy a new truck because the one that you guys have, you haven't done anything for. Um, otherwise you're going to be stuck with that bill and not have the cash flow to support it. Yeah. It makes sense. How many, how many companies did you go through, uh, before you found this one? Uh, I probably looked at, um, so there's like a one page teaser that most brokers and stuff will put out. I probably looked at, I don't know, 500 of those. Uh, <laughs> and then, but that takes a minute to look at. And a lot of that'll be geography, size, industry that you're not interested in, whatever. And you can filter out 90% of that right away. Um, and then they have a, um, confidential inf information memorandum or a SIM uh, called various different things, but it's kind of like a between a five and a hundred page PowerPoint document on that business, what its history is, where it's located, the employees, the histories of, of their financials, potential growth opportunities, all that stuff will be in there. Uh, I probably went through 75 of those. Wow. Uh, and again, you can pretty quickly sort stuff out from there. And then from that group, there's probably less than 10 that I was seriously considering. Um, and this ended up being the only one that I issued an actual offer for. Did you do any other LOIs or? 
Uh, no, I've um, offered to invest uh, in another friend doing a similar thing. And we had, we issued an LOI, but never got signed on that one. But not for my own acquisition. This was the only one. Okay, nice. So uh, what other, uh, what like, were you pretty much focused on this furniture industry? Or were you looking at other industries as well? Uh, this was the only one in the furniture space. And, uh, you know, it's the only one in Denver. So there's really, if I was looking at that, I'd be in trouble. Uh, and I didn't even know it existed or the industry existed other than like wedding rentals and stuff. Um, before I found this, uh, got connected with the broker and the seller. Um, so I looked at a couple contracting companies, I looked at a couple logistics companies. Um, those are mostly distribution type things. Like three PLs uh, or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, like last mile delivery kind of thing. Um, there's a company that does, uh, um, uh, flowers and manages flowers for office buildings. So make sure everything gets watered and changes things out. So they're blooming and all that stuff. Um, so they're contracted by your downtown office buildings and hotels and stuff. So another business that, you know, is right in front of you a fair amount of the time, but you never really think about, uh, but similar size. So that kind of thing I, I avoided, uh, didn't want anything to do with owning a restaurant or bar. Um, didn't want anything to do with firearms or cannabis, which is a big thing here in Colorado. Um, those are most of my industry wanted to stay away from. Oh, and then I looked at some like demolition and hauling companies is, uh, what kid doesn't want to own a bunch of bulldozers and stuff. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, didn't, didn't get anywhere with any of those. Um, yeah. I want to take a quick break from the episode and say, if you're enjoying this content, the best way you can say thank you is to subscribe. So if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And if you're on one of the podcast platforms, hit the subscribe button there as well. And also share it out to your friends and colleagues. If you find this content useful and you think other people will enjoy it as well, please send it out. And back to the episode. So, uh, so let's dive into the, the financing piece of it. So I think you, you did SBA on this, uh, what are, you know, you, you had some interesting lessons learned on the SBA. Uh, like, I think there's a couple points where the deal got like temporarily stalled just because, you know, you mentioned something about blood work and life insurance policy or something like that. And just like, what are, what are the, the things that someone going into an SBA needs to know and and also just maybe like even if case somebody listening doesn't even really understand the SBA maybe even just like kind of start from the beginning of yeah. how how businesses use it um so you can acquire a business with any type of financing you can buy it straight up with cash you can uh do 100% seller financing um, and seller financing would be you know Brian if you owned a company and i was buying it from you for 3 million dollars I would say, Brian, I owe you $3 million over the next 10 years um, at whatever percent interest rate we negotiate between us. And I'm at like my, it's now a loan that I have directly to you. It means that you don't get any of that cash up front. You'd get it in monthly payments as you would, you know, if you'd done finance my house directly with me. Uh, advantage of that is that we can close that deal tomorrow if we wanted to. Um, the disadvantage and why it doesn't happen that much on that scale is that you, the seller, don't get any of that money up front. You get it over time. Um, it could be beneficial from a tax point of view, could be beneficial from you know just having a steady income over time. Uh, but usually people want as much up front as they can. Um, you could have investment from family office or an institution that is going to provide the cash for the deal um, and not need a bank. Again, that can be done potentially pretty quickly. But if you go um, where you do need a bank, the bank is likely to be the bottleneck in when you have an offer until when you close the deal. Just uh, real quick um, so, to go back to the the family office or investment yeah. institution, uh, you know, for a deal like this, what what kind of equity would they typically be looking for in a deal? Uh, you know, putting you in as the operator and the the you know kind of uh, chief executive, yeah. but uh, so a traditional search funds, which is um, kind of a uh, a product that came out of Stanford and Harvard business schools in the eighties, uh, but allowed young people like me to buy larger businesses that they could afford. Uh, and most of the cash would come from these investors. They would still largely do 
uh, lending for 75 or 80 percent of the deal, but the other 20 percent would pretty much all come from investors. Those deals would typically be um, the CEO would get 8 percent of the company up front, another 8 percent based on performance, uh, and typically another 8 percent uh, on at the back end at, at sale uh, or other performance levers. So start at eight and potentially go up to you know twenty four ish percent. All of that is negotiable between you and your investors. Uh, so not fixed in stone, but that's that's one model of it. That's really Some low. I didn't, I didn't realize it was that low on a search fund model. Yeah, but those are also tend to be bigger deals. So they would have been, you know, my company um were we were about eight hundred and fifty K in free cash flow when I bought it. Um, so for three X ish multiple on that, um, and they would be 2 million plus in free cash flow at, you know, four or five X multiple. So you're looking at an eight to $12 million deal, um, and being able to get 8% of that without having to put any cash in is or 24% when you go to sell it, assuming you've grown it is, is a pretty good deal for a lot of people. And then uh, you were saying eighty percent would be financed from a bank still, and twenty percent by the by the um, the in, the investment institution. Likely doesn't always have to be that way. I have a, f- a friend here that did a similar thing, and they have a, a, a family office um, that's backing them, and they did one hundred percent financing from the family. Uh, so bought it outright with no bank loan. Um, so it gave them a lot more control over what they wanted to do. Uh, sped up the process, made it so they can act quickly and compensate people how they wanted to without any of the uh, restrictions that can come with either the bank or the SBA. So it, it's there's no there's no limit to the ways that you can go about financing a deal. Um, and they all kind of come with their pros and cons. Um, the SBA, your question, is the Small Business Administration. Um, it's a federal government body that is really designed to... I'm going to probably overstate this some, but like kind of keep the economy running. Um, most businesses in this country uh, are small businesses that are owned by people, owned by boomers. Um, and there's something like $10 trillion worth of wealth that is tied up in those businesses that at some point in the next you know 20 years needs to change to the next generation. Um, and for most folks, it's not affordable. Uh, you know, buying a business like what I bought, if I had to pay 30% down and um, have much more difficult loan terms with a conventional you know, non-federal government backed loan, uh, the finances would, would not have worked for me. I wouldn't have been able to do the deal. Um, so the SBA will back loans um, up to 90% of the purchase price and payable over 10 years. Most conventional loans will probably be 20% on the or 80% on the best case, really 70%. So you have to have 30% of the cash and payable over seven years. Uh, so you have to have more upfront and your monthly loan payment is going to be a lot higher because it's a much shorter payback period. Uh, so it makes it tougher. That said, it is a federal government body, so there are all kinds of governmental rules associated with it um, and processes for actually getting the loan approved. So if you are going the SBA route, which has a ton of benefits, um, you got to start early. Um, and I, the one for black and white rule for me that you have to do is use a uh, SBA preferred lender. And what that means is you can either apply directly to the SBA for a loan, which means you have some government employee who's the one reviewing your case, and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions about why you would be a good CEO and wanting to pin down your expertise in an area. And usually they're going to view that as a very like-for-like scenario. So for me, it would be, do you have any experience in the furniture industry? No, not qualified. Like pretty simple for them to disqualify. Whereas if you go to a bank that does this all the time, they can be like, okay, you have management consulting experience. You can figure out a PNL. You can figure out the operations. Like you've done this stuff that is, while not in the industry, is the same skill set, and you've proven that you're a smart, hardworking person. We are confident that you can learn the nuances of this and 
and go through it. So the SBA delegates this uh, vetting process to their preferred banks where my application for me was with Live Oak Bank. Um, Live Oak has the full authority to vet me, ask all those questions and approve the loan without having to go to the federal body to do it. Um, And that makes the process a lot faster, a lot more likely for more folks to succeed um, and a lot more painless uh, than going straight through a government agency. And most banks that are large uh, will have that. A lot of regional banks will as well, but super easy to find if you go on Google of banks with the largest uh, SBA, either by deal size or by deal count or by dollar figure, you'll get a pretty comprehensive list of good places to start. Is there any advantage to going direct to the SBA? Not really. Uh, There's, you know, you can do that remotely, but so there might not be a bank in person that you would want. So if if you were in a really rural area, but most of the people on that list, uh, you know, Live Oak has all they do pretty much is SBA lending. And we, there are people here in Denver that I've met, but I didn't meet them in person until after the deal had closed. Uh, so there, there are some advantages, but really not. Uh, I would avoid that at all costs. Uh, the related part to that is that any deal you do, well, they're effectively betting on you operating the business. So they're going to require um, life insurance for that loan amount if you know, the assumption is that if something happens to you that the business is going to fail and that their loan is going to be at risk so they want life insurance to be able to cover that um that ended up being what held us up two weeks because uh you have to get basically a full physical to get your life insurance approved so blood work your analysis a doctor's visit all that stuff uh, and i happen to have gone to the gym right before doing all of that. So when I got all my labs back, my blood sugar count was super low because I just burned it all and my protein level was super high because there was a bunch of broken down muscle tissue that was floating around my system. Um, And all that came back is like, something is wrong with you. And all of it meant that I had to go get retested uh, and that ultimately took a whole bunch of time. So um, that's one of those things that there's nothing stopping you if you're serious about this from doing that really early in the like right after you've got an LOI signed going and getting your life insurance um, process started. Yeah, cool. So what else uh, with the SBA, you mentioned there's like restrictions with it. What are what are some of the restrictions that people might need to consider with uh, with an SBA uh, backed loan? Um, so the one that most people will, uh, get surprised by is that you have to have a personal guarantee. Um, so any assets that you own, you're putting up as collateral. Um, so the house that I live in with my wife, all our equity in that, we had to collectively sign that over to the bank as at risk. Um, with that, like we can't do, uh, any home, home equity line of credit. Uh, for renovations or anything like that on the house um, that would materially change the the equity portion that we have available. Um, all the banks are, are people, so like you can work with them on some of those things. But from the personal side, like those are two of the big restrictions. On the deal size, uh, deal side of it, um, it really is a tool designed to transfer ownership to somebody else. Um, so there are a lot of deals that people look at as investors where. The owner wants to sell, um, you know, cash out somewhat and hand off some of the responsibilities, but they do really want to stay on as an employee. Uh, I'm done being the owner, happy moving to a W-2 at this phase in my career or, you know, a salesperson with commission or whatever. Um, And those deals can be fantastic. You don't have to have the expertise. You can bring in systems that you've developed elsewhere to help grow the business. You've got a guy running it that really knows it well. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why you would want to do that. The SBA won't let you, uh, you can have the seller stay on for up to a year. Uh, there has been some changes to this, but that's still generally the rule and really an employee, what though? Is, uh, stay on it. Yeah. As an employee, uh, or even a contractor. Um, and within that year, it really has to be focused on, uh, transitioning the business. 
there's no major like black and white monitoring. Like no one's going to come knock on your door. What's this person doing here? Um, Why do they restrict but, that? That doesn't make any sense. Why they would not allow the owner to stay on as an employee longer than that? Uh, is they they don't want to be there to like cash out the owner to stay as an employee. They want it to be where people like me become the owner. They, their goal is to have the business transfer generations. Uh, so they don't want the investor to use an SBA loan to keep an, a, a manager in place, but give him you know, the equity out that he wants. Uh, Interesting. I think there's definite limitations to that because having somebody that knows the business really well stay on makes a lot of sense, but that is a restriction. They've relatively recently updated this and it's changed a few times. So any banker you talk to, like make sure that you really get comfortable that they know what the most up-to-date rules are. Um, but it used to be that you had to sell hundred percent of the business. Um, now you're able to sell, uh, I believe no less than 80%. So you can stay on as a partial owner. And if you are, then you can stay on as an employee in the company. Um, usually you then also have to sign that personal guarantee for the loan. So most sellers don't want to do that. Um, and they want, if they want to stay on as an employee, they just want that money. They don't want to be responsible for failure of the loan or any of that stuff. But it is an option. Uh, it also, the restriction on, uh, you can have a seller note, which I, I definitely did. And I would recommend most people do at least 10% of the purchase price. So, for example, if you bought a business for $3 million, bucks, um, you could have the seller have a note for 300000 of that. So, uh, and, and usually the bank's going to require 10% from you. So if you go in, in a $3 million deal, you'd have to come up with 300000 seller would have 300,000 uh and then your loan would be for the remainder that 2.4 um and what the seller note would do would be whatever you negotiate so it would be Brian I'm going to pay you now $300,000 over 5 years to get you uh uh up to the full 3 million we can have an interest rate attached to that and I would also have performance metrics attached to that um so some level of comfort that the seller believes the company is still going to perform when they leave is really what you're looking for there. Uh, and that can be where uh, it's basically an earned down, like that 300,000 is the most that person's going to get from that note. And if the business underperforms for whatever reason, you start docking that. Uh, and in other deals, you can have seller carry, which is basically the reverse of that. Say so you're going to sell me the whole company, uh, I'm going to have the right to purchase, you know, whatever the last 5% from you in five years based on this multiple. And if we grow this business, like that last 5% could be worth quite a bit. We don't know now, but uh, instead of being worth 300,000 now, if we triple the size of the business, it's worth 900,000 in five years. Uh, and it's a real incentive for you to stay on and help grow the business. Uh, but SBA doesn't let it work in the, the upper route. They let it work down. So there's ways that you can make that uh, be closer to the same thing, uh, but most banks won't let you go beyond, uh, let's say, you know that that last bit is worth three hundred thousand. They won't let you go more than like twenty percent above that. So the max that I could write that note for would be three hundred sixty grand, um, based on growth trade criteria, and it would have to be max flat if it stayed if the performance of the company stayed flat interesting so uh let's details here the financing side but yeah i recently learned that too uh you know talk, talking to some bankers uh you know for, for some lending stuff i recently learned about that with the sba that you know you can't do an earn out it has to be the they call it uh seller's performance note or something like that where it's you know the, yeah. the opposite of an earn out Yep, exactly. Um, which it's really a bummer because you you think that everybody incentivizing them in the same direction. Like if you have an earnout, the only way that you're paying them a lot is if the business is worth a lot. So it's not crippling the company. It's not putting debt on it that, um, or or payment obligations that the company can't afford. So uh, it's it's unfortunate that that's the case, but um, it is. So you kind of got to work with it. 
Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's uh let's go into due diligence. I think that's a good way to kind of close out this this uh acquisition conversation. So uh what were what were some of the things that you did for due diligence? And uh, you know, is there anything like really interesting or or uh you know, any kind of pitfalls that you learned along the way? Yeah, uh, I mean I mentioned one already, um, uh, and that you if there's any equipment or inventory involved, like you really have to understand the condition of that um any loans again like and and as well as the financial side whether there's any loans against those trucks or long-term obligations to um to pay back any of that uh you you really want to know that pretty early um you also have to deal with any physical space leases or ownership uh so it's relatively straightforward if the person you're buying the business from also owns the property that it's using. You can either buy the business as well, and that would be a separate loan to do that. They're usually two separate legal entities anyway. Or you can negotiate with them a long-term lease to stay in the same spot, and you you lease the building from the owner. Uh, if it's a different entity, you know, any commercial real estate company, uh, you've got to figure out what's the process to get the lease transferred into your name. And again, I would start that super early, figure out what fees they're going to charge. They're almost always going to charge at least something on the really bad side. They might completely try to renegotiate the deal, uh, the terms of the lease. And you'll want to know that early because if they do, that's going to change what your financials are going forward. Um, so that's kind of some of the, the basic stuff there. Um, you really do want to get to know the seller really well. And whether you trust them, whether they're an honest person, uh, whether they strong on your customers, whether they treat their employees poorly, whether they have really high turnover, um, is you're going to be associated with them and their reputation, even if they walk out the door the day after the sale occurs and you never see or hear from them again. Um, and your business is going to be a, a reflection of them. And if they're if they're shady, if they you know, almost all their business is because they do some, you know, under the table bag of cash to somebody or pay for their Broncos tickets every year or whatever. Like that's might not be something that you want to be a part of. Um, so figuring out just the quality of the person that you're buying from is, is really high. And the only way to do that is to spend a lot of time with them. Um, then the basics of, figuring out the financials and, and the operating model of, of the business. Um, I would, especially in today's world, look back at as many years as you can get a hold of, ideally both sides of COVID and what especially the last 12 months has looked like. You'll want to see how resilient the company is for any shocks that occurred during that time. Some did great during COVID and have come down since then. Some did horribly during COVID and gone up since then. Some have stayed flat across. Um, so you want to understand that you really want to understand seasonality as if you buy, uh, for example, a, you know, tent rental company and you close in October, you're probably not going to rent a whole bunch of tents for weddings until May. And you're going to be on the hook for six months of loan payments and all that stuff until May that you might not have cash for. Um, uh, so you need to figure that out. And there's a bunch of ways that you can work around that, but you don't want to find that out when you close. Um, you'll want to see if you have any major customer concentration. Um, that was something that we dealt with here. Uh, and a lesson learned from me was beyond just getting comfortable that, yeah, we have a high, high customer concentration, but they either are contractually obligated to us or there's a reason why they're using us or it'd be really hard for them to switch. You can get comfortable with that. What I didn't do enough about is I really needed to actually get down to all of the leases, individual house leases with that customer. Um, and if I'd done that, I would have understood, great, these guys are awesome. They have a great relationship with us. They're going to keep using us. However, a ton of our relationship with them was came as a result of supporting about 100 people after a fire a few years ago, which is great that we got that business but you know after a year and a half a lot of those renovations and repairs are done and between when i went under loi and the end of this year that customer their annual billing went down by about half 
Um, and I didn't understand that. Before. What percentage of that was of 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 the total revenue that that one customer? Uh, of the one customer, there were about forty percent. So that was about twenty percent of our revenue. Uh, wow. Okay. A significant drop. Yeah. yeah. Have you have yeah, you refilled so that since then, or we're starting to? Uh, but right now we're operating pretty much break even post debt service. Um, and that's partly a byproduct of being in the winter and being our slow season uh, and a byproduct of there hasn't been a, a major event like that that's happened, fortunately, this past year here. So that's really my goal of how do we grow the business on all of the non-disaster things so that we can be you know, running at at least a 20% uh, net income margin outside of any of the disaster stuff. So day in, day out, we know that we're going to be solidly making money and then we do that work when it comes up it's it's a bunch of gravy on top but we're not dependent on it yeah absolutely yeah it's just mm-hmm. good uh good insights here uh i didn't i had a question that popped in my head about the sba stuff because we we were yeah. uh, you know I, I was meeting a ton of people at uh at that conference or at the main street summit in missouri uh that it seemed like they had multiple businesses with multiple SBA loans across their portfolio. Uh, is there like a cap on that? Or can you just keep every new company you buy, you just add another SBA loan? Uh, there is. Uh, generally, that cap is $5 million in debt. Um, there's some ways around that. If you're a minority investor, they'll consider your portion of that debt you know, much lower. So... Uh, you know, for this business, I have a little bit, a little bit over two million. So in theory, I could buy another, get another three-ish million dollars worth of SBA loans um, to where you know I'm still the primary owner, and that's certainly something that we would look at both for inorganic growth of our of new image as well as if I, there's this got stable and I was looking to acquire something else with, uh, be more of a passive owner uh, in in another business. Um, but if I was, you know, investing fifty thousand dollars in you buying a business and you were the CEO, most of the capital was coming from elsewhere. You had most of the equity, and I had, you know, ten percent or whatever. Whatever debt came from that, the SBA wouldn't really count against my five million dollar cap. So there's there's ways that that's not black and white, but generally that five million is is sort of the the ceiling that most people should think about. Interesting, yeah. Uh, and that can be spread across a couple of businesses. That can be one business. So if you buy a $10 million business, you'll get 5% or 5 million up to in SBA lending. And then you have to figure out the other three between investors, your down payment and, uh, and a seller note to, to get you the rest of the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Well, this has been a super good episode. I think we covered like real, a lot of really good insights here. Uh, any other like closing notes that we didn't cover? Uh, yeah. Uh, you asked one question at the beginning of like why someone would do this versus starting their own thing. Uh, and uh, the main reason or main two reasons, I guess the people go this route that I certainly was a part of was one, you don't have an idea for something you want to start. Um, I'm not that creative person, so it was for me made a lot of sense to have somebody else have come up with a good idea, um, and I can take it and run with it and, and figure out how to make it operate better. Um, so that was number one, and then number two was, uh, in, I think the statistics like 90% of new businesses fail within the first uh, within the first like two years. Um, you have potential for going from you know zero to a lot depending on what you start, but. You're also exposing yourself to a ton of risk um, and a lot of reasons. There's a million reasons why things might not work out. But buying a business, uh, a lot of that stuff's already been proved out. You have customers that are already paying you. You have employees that you don't have to hire. Um, you have a lot of systems in place. And a lot of the things that you would be beating your head against the wall trying to figure out for the first you know, one to 10 years, uh, in a lot of cases, they've they've already been figured out and it's your job to take it to the next level. Um, so that's why most people that look at buying a business end up following through with it. Um, it's certainly not the right thing for everybody. There's a lot of people that are serial creators that want to go from an idea in their head to a, a company. Uh, but I think that the number of people that 
realistically fit that category are few and far between. Uh, and some people that probably shouldn't be doing that talk themselves into trying to do that. Uh, and you know, their real strength is is operationalizing something else or marketing, and they can take a product and take it to uh, you know an extra five million customers or whatever it is. So uh, that's the main reason why people, uh, and certainly why I consider acquisition instead of starting, uh, and and the main reason why most go that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you touched on something earlier, uh, you know, this like greatest wealth transfer in history uh, with the boomer generation. There's just so much businesses. There's so there's so much value in businesses that are going to be transferring a lot of, you know, a lot of a lot of, you know, uh, businesses are owned by people who need to retire. They don't have kids or family that are going to take it over. Uh, and there's, you know, for our generation, there's just such a massive opportunity for people who are de- detail oriented, hard workers, and, you know, just ready to, to grind on a, on a business. Uh, there's, there's so many, uh, there's so many businesses out there. Yeah. The, the two things on that are, um, I think it's like three quarters of existing businesses don't have a succession plan in place. Um, uh, so right now, most of them are planning on just closing it whenever they retire, uh, or haven't thought about it at all. So providing a way for folks to you know, make some money when they they retire and close down uh, i think is uh, well deserved for people that have built great businesses over their their lifetime um it gives a lot of people like me an opportunity to walk into something that that already exists um and the second part of that is is remembering that like these people that are selling in most cases like this has been their their life's work this is their single biggest asset that they've ever had to their name as their company uh, and one surefire way to shoot yourself in the foot if you're looking to acquire something is to just not be a good person. Uh, so don't, it, it's, it is not the same as looking to buy a million dollars worth of stock. You're buying someone's company, someone's legacy, uh, the responsibility that they've had for those employees and their clients for years and years and years. And if, you know, your first meeting with them, you come across as a cold hearted person that's going to fire their staff or tear their business model apart or whatever, likelihood that you're going to get a deal done is is almost zero. Uh, and you probably shouldn't because that's not what small businesses are about. So um, final takeaway for me is just be a good person as you go through this process. Understand that there's a lot of emotions uh, very reasonably in play and you know, whatever a playbook tells you to do, you have to bounce that off of the reality of who who's involved in the deal itself. Yeah, that that's that's a good closing note. And uh, man, that, thanks for coming on. You packed a lot of wisdom here in this, uh, a lot of firsthand wisdom in this episode. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's been a pleasure. 